instead of <coughs> but um, any questions from last week's presentation by uh, Dr. Marylander about the impacts of growth in California on water uh, supplies the things she was talking about and how the type of development is going to impact uh, the, 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 the effects on water resources the, the, she, she put up those maps about uh, these uh, exurban um, growth is going to have a much larger impact than infill, let's say, infill uh, growth because it's taking away a lot of other, other um, ecosystem services. I, I have a question. Um, in earth science, we learned that the dirtier the air, like um, from farming or something like that, more dust in the air, uh, the more rainfall we get. Is, is that true in, in your sense? Do you... So maybe the more smog we have, the more population. It's more related have. towards the, uh, the specific sources of particulates aren't, aren't real clear, but it is well known that particulates serve as a nucleus for water drops. So do you think there's a possibility with population growth we might have more rainfall? Uh, or is that just we're not seeing that so much, so are we? Question answer. Don't worry. Really good at giving that answer to it. <laughs> it's not known. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. Our speaker today is uh, Aaron Majors. Aaron Majors is an owner and construction department manager at Cagwood and Dorward. Cagwood and Dorward is a uh, is a uh, landscape design contract. What do you design? Do they design? Okay. So, uh, build maintenance. Uh, landscape services company out of Nevada, California. Uh, he leads his team to build a state commercial and public projects throughout Northern California since 2003. He has a BS degree in ornamental horticulture from Cal Poly Slow in 1996. Uh, he's a landscape industry certified manager and technician. Yes, I got my degree with it. So, uh, he places a high priority on developing his team in, with leadership and industry training. Throughout his career, he has overseen the sales and development of project management of over $50 million in landscape construction projects. Notable projects include the renovation of Sunset Publishing's Gardens in Neville Park, award-winning estates in Napa, and the Hennepin Haven Garden here at UC Davis. He believes successful projects are built on collaborative relationships and through balancing budget, craftsmanship, and schedule. Bay-friendly and other sustainable landscape specs have been a new venture for him and a part of Tagwood and Dora's transition to becoming part of the solution. Aaron has a passion for building landscapes by creating an enjoyable customer experience. I mentioned this uh, Bay-friendly uh, uh, principle, so I just handed out, because I know some of you haven't gotten this, you came a little late. But this book is an adaptation of the Bay-friendly uh, landscape guidelines. Uh, Bay-friendly landscape guidelines is a project that was originated out of Alameda County, uh, stopwaste.org, now it's a uh, uh, the area coalition um, and uh, the projects, they're, all the landscape projects are encouraged to follow these principles. Um, this document was adapted for the Central Valley, um, and that's why it's called River Fun. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, um, I forgot, I'm sorry. I have to make a comment about the power of social media. Uh -oh. We found it today on Facebook that today is your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody found out and told me. Fun way to spend my birthday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take me out to lunch. So, <laughs> so uh, you covered my first three slides about me. So okay. Too, and I'm just kidding, but I can tell you a little bit more about me. Um, I, I'm passionate about technology, software, and, and social media. Um, I speak to other groups that are probably uh, a little less uh, aware of social media. I would assume. So I, I like to put it out there um, to people and try to encourage more people uh, of my generation and my peers to use it because I think it can improve how we communicate. Um, as Lauren said, Cagman George is a full service landscape contractor. We do uh, 
landscape maintenance, construction, tree care, erosion control, water management. Uh, we do that for commercial, municipal, and uh, residential customers throughout the Bay Area. We have uh, 13 locations um, servicing most of Northern California. Uh, and we, we serve our customers in a customer-centric way. So, um, a, a little bit about what I like to focus on in construction, and that's um, creating a successful landscape experience. Uh, in, in order for us to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace as contractors, we need to do something different. And as a company, we've chosen to be customer-centric and, and focus on uh, the value we can provide our customers of value over price. So we created uh, this graphic and we created some um, principles that we like to follow and we like to train our people with um, that I help, I think help serve our customers. And that's uh, balancing uh, budget or costs, uh, the craftsmanship, and schedule. Um, and all of that built on the relationship. So, uh, you know, with the relationships built by listening and building personal connections, uh, building trust and personal connections. Schedule, we like to be flexible and adaptable with deadlines for our project. Um, craftsmanship, quality meets expectations. And um, the budget, costs are complete in alignment with goals. So following those principles, um, we find that it's a balance of, of those things. And you'll find that the schedule craftsmanship budget is actually built on another theory of, of project management um, triangle. And that it's a balance of those three that creates a successful project. <clears throat> so today I'll talk about uh, some case studies, three projects, um, two of which I was heavily involved in. One, I'll give you an overview and um, share a little bit about what I know. We'll talk about uh, return on investment, um, how you can pay for landscape renovations, water use reduction through water use reductions and maintenance cost reductions. We'll talk about some sustainable solutions in design and construction with uh, soil management and development, fertigation, uh, organic installation and maintenance. And we'll talk about uh, the collaborative relationship that can be created with architects and contractors. So the first project is Drake's Landing. Um, it's the first bay-friendly certified project, commercial certified project, uh, in Marin County. Um, the owner is uh, Equity Office Properties, who is the largest uh, owner property management company in the country of commercial office property. And it, the project's in uh, Larkspur, right on the bay. Uh, if you know the Larkspur area, as you go over the 101 freeway heading north, it's on the left in that lagoon area. The landscape designer is Susie Dodd Markarian. Um, it was built in November 2009. So it had over two acres of lawn that were sheet mulched and replaced with uh, low water use plants. 75% um, of the plant palette um, that we used was a low water use plants that went back in. No new turf, and all the shrubs were converted to drip irrigation. So um, a typical commercial landscape. Uh, behind the photographer there is the bay. Um, and we'll see a few pictures of that, but large expanses of turf in a commercial office setting, which in my opinion is fairly useless. Very aesthetic, but <laughs> not very useful. Um, it happens to be along a walking path that's adjacent to a lot of homeowners associations. So a lot of people travel by here, and this gets a lot of use on a weekend. Um, but it's, the owner is um, the office building owner and the tenants that utilize the property. So uh, we did uh, sheet mulching, and I want to go through the steps of, of sheet mulching because I think it's fairly new to the industry. Uh, who's familiar with sheet mulching and knows that, that process? Anyone? No? So I'll go through the, the steps for that. It's very simple. Uh, it's labor intensive, but uh, I think the benefits uh, far away the costs. So the, the process, the first step is um, simply shutting water off to the lawn. Um, and back up, the, the, the value of doing sheet mulching over the traditional method, which on a lawn like this may be to sod cut and off haul all that material, or it would be to 
spray it with herbicide and, and the sod cutting off all, or spray it out with herbicide and till it all under. So the value of, of doing the sheet mulching is that there's a whole um, life that lives in that lawn and in that soil below there of soil biology. And by hauling all that off, you're losing those valuable organisms that are going to help build your soil in the future. So that's why we want to shift uh, towards doing sheet mulching with turf areas. So you can see the first step um, the guys did here, they just saw it cut in the perimeter. So you have to think about the profile material that's going to come in here and the fact that um, the perimeter is already at grade. And so unless you get that edge down to fill that new profile of compost, cardboard, and mulch, you're going to have all that material built up on the edge and it's going to be off in your sidewalks and your hardscape areas. So a significant portion of work is, is the first step was sod cutting but it's really excavating that down and pulling all that material up and just kind of throwing it up in the landscape. <coughs> so uh, here's some of the next steps. This is the same area. The guys have got the, the edges <coughs> excavated down. They're rolling out a layer of cardboard and they're spreading compost, uh, three inches of compost on top of that cardboard. So that's, it's that simple, it's those steps. It's recycled cardboard. We buy it in large rolls and it's organic uh, compost that we're using. This large turf area. You're putting it on top of the existing lawn? Yeah. So this large turf area uh, was actually originally uh, specified to be Carex uh, Panza, and part of the bay friendly process uh, for scoring was to create habitat. And so we worked with the landscape designer to substitute for wildflowers and so we created this um, wildflower mix and uh, hydro seeded it uh, actually right on top of compost which was a little bit of a concern of mine that it would actually grow in that compost um, but it was it was finished compost it was not as hot as some new compost you get so it grew great in it actually um, another area that was sheet mulch but uh, being just planted and drip irrigated, so you can see the guys working with uh, planting and, and running drip to each of the plants. Um, a little bit about the, the savings, so water quality protection practices, by not uh, spraying and doing the traditional demolition method, we saved uh, about a pound and a half of glyphosate, Roundup, from going into the landscape and into, I mean, right behind those guys is the bay. And Lauren will be happy to tell you where that glyphosate would be <laughs> very quickly from runoff. Um, so that was saved, um, 175,000 pounds of grass that would have been hauled to a landfill. And um, the, the plans long-term are, uh, and we are doing now, integrated pest management. So there's a minimal chemical usage from a, a water quality protection, we also didn't add any new hardscape surfaces. So on the water use side, um, this chart's a little confusing. I actually stole somebody else's chart, but um, <coughs> MAW is the maximum allowable water uh, allowance, maximum applied water allowance. And prior to the renovation, it was calculated at 2.6 million gallons. Um, skip over the estimated prior to because I don't even understand that myself. The actual uh, total water used before the renovation was 2.5 million gallons. So it was using basically around where it was calculated for uh, based on, this is all based on uh, the WELO uh, water calculations. So um, after the renovation, uh, it was estimated to use about 2 million. So that's based on the new plant material. It should have been using about 2 million. And the actual water use is about 1.2 million. So we saved uh, about 53% of the water on the project. Um, I've got some interesting charts looking at like, water savings and maintenance cost savings on this project. And we'll talk about later uh, the return on investment. but. As the cost of water increases, um, I don't know about Davis, but I know in the Bay Area it's significant. 
Um, I know it's insignificant in Sacramento. I think it's 75 cents a unit or something in Sacramento. Uh, in this area, Marin Water District is, I would say, one of the leading water districts for um, water conservation and for their aggressive water conservation practices. They have water police. Um, they were one of the first ones to have a tiered water rate structure. And so um, if you're up in the tier three, tier four, you're in the $12 a unit range for water. So saving 53% of the water on the site very quickly starts to pay for doing landscape renovations. So uh, another shot of the wildflowers um, and the, the habitat was created. Um, did anybody happen to see this in person? No, travel down there. Did you get down there? Yeah. <laughs> That's right, we toured it together right over okay. Easter. Yeah, over Easter. And that's what I was going to point out. Um, when we were there, there were literally hundreds of families out there in their Easter clothes shooting their Easter pictures. And it was, it was a rewarding experience for me to see an impact that landscaping can make in a quantifiable way other than water savings or dollar savings, the things that most people want to go to for measurements. And so my measurement was the hundreds of people that I saw that day enjoying the landscape um, that wouldn't have been doing that on Carex Panzai, and they wouldn't have been doing that on the old turf grass lawn. I mean, it, it, turf grass is enjoyable, but not like this was. It was just, it was an amazing experience. So I, I like to quantify things other than cost, and um, I think it's a, it's a challenge to try and quantify community and environmental impacts and the rewards you can get from those things. The, the next project is the Willows uh, Eco Gardens. Uh, we've maintained the site for years, I'd say 10 plus years. And uh, it's a small shopping center in Concord. Uh, it was designed with UC Davis Arboretum All Stars plant material. And it was designed with bay friendly specs, although it wasn't bay friendly certified. Uh, we used compost tea and kelp through the summer months for the plant material, unless the plant material is native and it had some stress on it, so enhancing the soil food web by uh, using uh, organisms in the, in the compost tea or food for the organisms. Uh, I, again, what's unique about this project and something that we do differently is collaborating with our customers and other people, <coughs> creating uh, a successful landscape experience or creating a community event. So in this case, we had a grand opening. Uh, we were able to uh, bring in the UC Master Gardeners from Contra Costa County. Um, we partnered with uh, the California Center for Urban Horticulture, and Missy and Dave helped uh, bring the Master Gardeners to uh, the program, as well as getting the Arboretum All-Star spec on the project. And the property manager, Colliers International, was very supportive, and then of course, Cagwin and Doherty, um, our ownership group, uh, the operations team for this project and our sustainability manager were all actively involved in the installation and the, uh, the grand opening event. So again, <clears throat> what's unique, the differentiator for us was creating this, this grand opening um, that supported the community and the marketing that we got through that, which was a shared cost for us with all these other stakeholders. And so there was a lot of press generated from it and a lot of the community enjoyed uh, the experience, and that was cost, again, shared amongst the team. So uh, as a company, we're, we're not big on advertising. In fact, we don't advertise at all. Um, and a lot of the press and uh, value we get of marketing is coming doing something like this, speaking at other events, uh, or having these community events, and sharing with people the work that we do not making an investment in the phone book or traditional advertising methods, which are usually proven to not be that successful. So the Master Gardeners had a plant sale, that's Missy, um, talking about salvia maybe. Um, but it, it was a cool event, other than it was 110 degrees, I think, that day, and everybody was melting. Uh, it was pretty fun. Another element of the project, out by the freeway, they've created this eco-critter farm where they're doing um, school tours now. Uh, there's worm bins out there with earthworms and they've cycled those earthworms back into the landscape to do some natural tilling of the heavy clay soils. Uh, and then there's a 
some beneficial insects uh, in a little cage with lace wings and, and uh, ladybugs. And they've done releases of those on the property. All of this is focused around doing school tours and generating um, interest for the community in that area for the shopping center that's there. As well, there's on-site composting, uh, which I'd say is a huge leverage point uh, for all of us that, that have an influence on design. Uh, from the commercial maintenance perspective, um, other than grass cycling, which we do on all of our projects, um, most of the other material comes off of the site. And so uh, part of our transition is figuring out customers that are open to doing uh, composting on their site of that material and the most sustainable way is to retain that material there, compost it, and put it right back into their landscapes. Um, although there's been limited interest from our customers, um, I think we're making some progress. And I think you'll see, um, you know, my vision would be in 10 or 20 years, it's just what everybody does. Uh, but right now it's a little too innovative for some people. So Harbor Bay uh, medians, the best picture I could find was Street View. Um, this project is along Harbor Bay Parkway in Alameda. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. Quick sorry. question on, yeah. on the willows. Yeah. How did you? Uh, how did that project come about? Was it the uh, developer doing the shopping center wanted to do something sustainable, or was there some other incentive? Um, it was actually generated out of Cagwin and Dower's desire to do a demonstration garden for Arboretum All Stars and searching for a customer that was open to doing this. Uh, they actually paid, our original goal I think was to do a very small renovation. We were actually gonna do it at our own cost. And finding this customer, it turned into a much larger renovation. They paid for the whole project. Um, so that's how it came about. <clears throat> so this, uh, and this project's in progress now. So you won't see a lot of finished shots and, and data on this because it just broke ground in beginning of September and it's kind of rolling full speed right now. But Harbor Bay Parkway starts uh, at the Oakland Airport and runs out to the ferry terminal. Um, all of the private development along here, most of it is owned by Harbor Bay Business Park Association. There's one very large developer that started building out here 15 or 20 years ago. Um, the recognizable landmark, I think, is uh, the Oakland Raiders practice field that's along there. And so this renovation is the median island strip. Uh, it's a mile and a half <coughs> long, 120,000 square feet, I think. And it's owned by the city of Alameda, but it's a unique relationship, I want to point out, that the Harbor Bay Business Park Association administers the maintenance of this through Landscape and Lighting District money, property tax money through those local businesses. And that money siphons through um, the city of Alameda to the private uh, developer or business park association. And they administer contracts for maintenance and construction. So it's a private project, private money. Uh, but, well, I should take that back. It's public money, but somehow it becomes private money because it's going through a private company. And it's on public land. So, um, the city of Alameda is the owner. Um, the landscape architect is April Phillips Design Works. Uh, is anybody familiar with April Phillips? I don't know who she is, no. Um, prominent Bay Area landscape architect. Um, the goal is to create a sustainable water conserving and habitat enhancing landscape that sets a new eco friendly image. Um, and here you can see part of the Oakland Raiders practice field. And the work we're doing is only on these islands which um, I'm guessing is maybe 25% of the total area. So <coughs> all of this is common area as well. It's all parkway turf. All along the frontage of here is all common, and it's all turf. Um, I take that back. There's a little bit of shrubs along the fence along the properties here, but almost all turf. Um, and the median islands is all turf, and there are no trees. I mean, it is literally just turf. It's an interesting landscape. So they knew they wanted to do something different. Um, and so back to the, the design intent. Um, it was to replace the existing turf with a green eco-friendly landscape following the Bay-Friendly guidelines. 
The current estimated water usage of just the islands is about 3.6 million gallons. The uh, projected reduction would be down to about 1.2 million gallons of usage in a year. So about 65% reduction in water. In progress, uh, sod cutting. Uh, so they went along the perimeter edge into the sod cutting, flopped it up in the street. Um, you can see that's San Francisco in the background. Um, that's the view from this area. So first step in, in sheet mulching, sod cut, flop that up. Uh, next step is, is coming along with um, excavator, a mini excavator or a backhoe, and scraping that and moving that soil up up on top and creating a mound, which you can see a little bit in this picture. So that this, these areas were flat when we started with turf. And so uh, this one looks like it's just graded and a one inch layer of compost put on top. Um, this sheet mulching was done a little bit differently. There's a benefit to having a layer of organic cardboard and then another layer of organic compost on top. And they actually paid additional for that on this project. We in the past have done it with just cardboard and then the compost on top of the cardboard. So um, that picture is just a layer of compost. This is the one inch layer of compost and you can just see here a little bit of cardboard and then another one inch layer of compost on top of that all being mounted up. And that's about where the project is right now um, in progress. They've got all of the sheet mulching done and they've just started doing drip irrigation prior to planting. So uh, my chance to advertise, next Wednesday, there's a community event that we created um, to have a groundbreaking ceremony, learn about Bay Friendly, uh, demonstrate sheet mulching, um, and meet community members. So the, we've got the city of Alameda uh, excited about the project, and they're going to uh, have the mayor speak and the head of the planning department. In one of those islands, we'll be able to do sheet mulching so people can see how that process works. And uh, stopwaste.org or Bay Friendly will be out there, East Bay Mud, uh, Water District will be out there, and it should be an exciting event. Aaron, so, yes? Can you give us just a, maybe a summary of what April's plans are and what she has putting in there? Uh, yeah, it's actually pretty simple. Um, the concept is a wave, right? It's on the ocean, and so she's got the idea of, of waves of plant material. Um, the plants are two grasses, Stipa tenuissima and Festuca, I can't remember which one. Um, there are Maidland roses going in. There is a Formium, I don't remember which one. Um, there is no mo fescue going in, so about 20,000 square feet of this is no mo fescue. That fine fescue that looks sort of left meadowy looking? Yeah, oh, no. and that's being done on all the left turn lane island tips oh, for view, right? Yeah. So you won't have any fun to throw up in the way of the view of those turning areas. Did you say 25,000 or 20,000? 20, 20,000 square foot <coughs> of uh, no mo. And um, Hemarcalis Stella de Oro, or maybe it might be a or something. One of the ways this project was sold that I could share with you is that uh, we originally bid this for over half a million dollars and the customer came back and said, I have to save money. So going through a process of value plant material, changed some of the spacing and changed the sizes of the plants. And we were able to drop the project to about $430,000 um, just through that process. So little things like, can we plant the grasses at 14 inches on center instead of 12 saves $5,000 over a mile and a half. So little things like that that you can't really see that um, will make a benefit to uh, their bottom line cost and allow the project to go forward. So um, I wanted to ask the question, what does value mean to you? Do they have a definition of what value is to them? Know a couple of people's names in here, so. <laughs> <laughs> so 
what do you think values when you when when you're providing a service to somebody? What are they looking for with that? Yes. Well, first, return on investment. So, like a landscape for a home is twenty percent of the value of the home. Okay. Um, personally, I think it's an undetermined value because the landscape gives back continuously over year upon year upon year. Especially sure. if there's trees that get really old. What does it and give back? What does it give back? Um, anything from oh. relaxation to Privacy to sure. Um, so not quantifiable things. You started with cost. Absolutely true. Yeah. Right? So cost is some percentage. Even maintenance. Sure. If you don't do it yourself. Sure. But what I like is you moved past cost and you moved on to community and environmental impacts, right? Mm -hmm. And the benefit that you get from those. And right. those aren't quantifiable. No, especially if you're planting plants that or bees love plant. or butterflies sure. love or sure. something else that's going to create a good environment. Sure. So uh, there's a quote I like to use. It's uh, price is what you pay, value is what you get. That's from Warren Buffett. Um, and I, I, in my business and working with customers, I like to live that because as a contractor, what we do, we're not the low price leader. I can guarantee you every time we do a job, you can find somebody who can do the job for a lower price. Playing the low price game is, is not what we choose to do as contractors. Um, there's a lot of contractors that are successful at doing that, but their business model is different than ours. So, you know, the point with return on investment is that um, not enough of our work is appreciated for the aesthetic value that it provides or the environmental value. And that trying to find an angle to customers who are focused on price, um, this is one of those avenues for them. And unfortunately, uh, you'll come across probably more of those in your career until uh, more people shift to the value of environment, right? And they want to actually make a difference in um, this world. I like to say that current landscaping practices are destroying the world. And Lauren proved that to me when I watched his presentation on what's coming out of our landscapes and what's being put down. Um, it's pretty disturbing. And unfortunately, I work for a company that's a part of that. Um, I'm a part of an industry, I'm a part of practices that use these pesticides uh, and herbicides, and um, it's built into what we do. And we're trying to change that machine um, through our decisions. And so I take those decisions seriously and try to make those changes with my people, um, with the training that we do, and with the customers as well, because a lot of it's being driven by customers who will say, no, <laughs> I want the cheapest thing, which is spraying, um, and they're not willing to make an investment in other alternatives. So on, a little more on, on ROI. So the cost of water and the cost of, of maintenance are a major driver for projects, and um, there's, there's a few different things we've found that, that have provided some value to our customers. One is the installation of smart or ET controllers. Um, who's familiar with those? One person. So all the landscapes you'll design are going to get irrigation delivered to them through a controller. And the traditional controller is the ones we all know about that you set the days of the week and how many start times and how many minutes. Um, those are as good as whatever information you put in them and how often you change that information. And weather changes on a daily, hourly basis. And what happens with smart controllers is they update the water delivery to the landscape based on what the weather was the day before. And so you get the benefit of micro changes to the delivery of water, which could just be, we're gonna water the lawn one less minute tomorrow. And um, over time, huge benefits. So we find um, that an average landscape will get about a 30% reduction in water simply by installing a, a smart controller, which um, ranges in cost from a, maybe $1,000 to $5,000, depending on what type of controller you're using. So one of the example projects we have is an eight-year-old HOA in Brisbane. Um, as far as I know, Brisbane's got the highest water rates uh, in the state that I've found so far. They're at about $9.75 for a base unit, and the tiers go up from there. So uh, we installed about $50,000 worth of smart controllers out there. And we're able to reduce their water 
uh, by over 30% and pay for those controllers in just less than one year. So from an investment standpoint, it's a no-brainer. Um, why not uh, make a short little investment in your capital expenses and reduce your operating expenses and do a good thing for the environment at the same time? Uh, a typical landscaping project like Drake's Landing or Harbor Bay, the return on investment is much longer. You're looking at more like a 10-year range. And so if you put on your Wall Street hat and think from an investment standpoint, most investors aren't into 10 years. It's too far for them. Um, it's hard for them to connect with um, their money sitting out there that long to get it back. So one year is much more practical, and I think that's why you're not seeing landscape renovations happening based on these types of principles. So, and then the community environment. I like to drive the value of community environment, try and quantify these things through doing community events for our customers, and, and shift from price to value with those customers. So, education on water, energy and pollution, um, connecting the quantifiable changes with the project with less to landfill, produced water and things, um, and make an emotional appeal. Uh, I often thought it'd be great to quantify um, community and environmental things where you told people how many polar bears they saved, right? <laughs> now you have like an emotional reaction to, I chose to spend my money this way, or as a manager, I chose to spend my company's money this way. And here's what the impact that made. I think it's funny, but it's serious. I think if you could quantify it in a way that people emotionally connect with, you'll make a difference. So, run out of time as usual. Um, sustainable solutions in design and construction. So, some practical things that we're doing as a company um, that I think are somewhat unique for the commercial industry. They're not new by any means, um, but they're unique for a large company to be doing something like this. Uh, soil development and management. So, just simply starting with testing for soil biology. Typical specs include doing soil tests for chemical analysis. And the shift now is to test for soil biology. And bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, fungi, mycorrhizal colonization, um, the living organisms that are in their soil that control diseases on their own, control insects on their own, fix back uh, nitrogen for the plants to grow on their own naturally, and separate us from the synthetic spoon feeding of fertilizer that most traditional landscapes need, as well as uh, pesticides. So that's one change, is doing soil biology testing. Uh, Respecifying projects with organic compost. Um, most of the projects I see plant and specs say uh, naturalized sawdust, so that's their traditional spec for a landscape uh, architect. And naturalized sawdust is not sustainable. It's recycled, I mean, it's a byproduct of the lumber industry. But um, it, we are currently buying our organic compost, which is much more local. It's not being trucked from the forestry industry to us. It's being created uh, locally in our own counties. Uh, it's cheaper, uh, it's organic, and it is full of soil life that we're trying to regenerate in our landscapes. Promoting sheet mulching uh, in lieu of the old methods applying compost tea and biostimulants. So the compost tea has the soil life uh, in it. It's the bacteria, protozoa, and nematodes alive that you put down on the landscape, um, add biostimulants, uh, and grow the, the soil life. And organic and pesticide free. So that's usually an education issue. Most customers um, aren't OK with weeds in their lawn weeds and the cracks of the sidewalks and things. So we have to educate them that you know maybe it's okay to have a few weeds and not to be spraying pesticides in the landscape. And that's a challenge to overcome. One way we've, we've found is we can um, hurt and heal. Uh, I learned this from our sustainability manager. And that is to use a pesticide or an herbicide like say Roundup to spray out a weed because it's gotta be done. Number one to that customer is keeping the weeds out, and if we can't do that, they'll find somebody who will. So spray out that weed, and then come back after and spray compost tea 
which is the next step in healing that soil after we've just put that uh, herbicide in the ground. Yes? What did you say a biostimulant was? Food for soil biology. So, so fertilizer? No, well, no, it would not be fertilizer. It would be uh, organic material itself. Like palm. Sea kelp uh, oh. is a biostimulant. Um, I think of other ones off the top of my head. Um, but there's other organic materials that nematodes live off of, fungi live off of, bacteria live off of, that you will feed and build the soil food web with. I like this one. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about fertigation, but um, it, it's a fact that fertilizer use for the commercial landscape industry is destroying our oceans, and it's creating uh, dead zones near the coastlines. So uh, one of the solutions that we've found is using fertigation systems, and that is putting a tank in with your fertilizer, or excuse me, a fertilizer tank in with your irrigation system to deliver fertilizer through the spray or rotors or drip system directly to the plant material. By doing that, you can um, reduce the quantity of material because it's actually getting to the plant easier. Uh, you can reduce the amount of labor significantly. And you can actually pay for the installation of these systems very quickly. It's also an easy way to deliver biostimulants and to switch from synthetic to organic. So what I'm doing now, our company's doing, is going through um, and proposing this to all of our customers and trying to get them to switch over so we can start using, uh, rather than the organic-based fertilizer, granular fertilizer we use, we can now use fish emulsion, which is 100% organic, and we can add a biostimulant at the same time. We can reduce the cost associated with fertilization, and then we can have this benefit to the environment. So, who's familiar with the soil food web? Anyone? I hated fertilizers. I got a D in fertilizers, just so you know. Uh, I didn't want anything to do with soil uh, when I was in college. And uh, D for done. And, uh, yeah, I was into constru landscape construction. Well, I took that back. I was into rugby and partying. But other than that, I was into uh, landscape construction. And it didn't have any, to me, it didn't have anything to do with fertilization or maintenance or pesticides or anything. So I really put no value on um, organic chemistry, biology, fertilizers, soils, anything like that. Um, I've come to regret that now, understanding how important that is to what we do. And that um, it's a dynamic situation that you have to understand the system of, not understand, well, I just do this and it solves the problem. So I, I encourage you all. Um, to look more into this. Um, I would say one of the changes you're seeing in the industry is going from a typical spec of nitrilized sawdust and fertilizer to testing for the soil food web and the soil biology, and then replenishing the soil biology through a landscape renovation process. And on the right, this is the number one tool for any landscaper, a soil probe. So know what's in your, what type of soil you have, and how much water do you have in your landscape? So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip that one, and we'll go to uh, collaboration. So an important part for me in working with my customers and in working with, you know, I'll start with my customers, because to me, these are all customers. Um, we have landscape architects and designers we work with. We have the customer and the owner. And we have contractors, us or general contractors. Because sometimes we're sub, sometimes we're the prime. So we have up to what I would call three customers on any job. And um, they don't always agree with what they want to do, which is one of the biggest challenges we have. So who do you think is the most important in that relationship of owner, landscape architect, and general contractor? Anyone want to guess? Mm -hmm. Customer? Anyone else? Why the customer? Because they're the client. They're paying for it, right? No, it's not money. You're providing a service to mm -hmm. them, and so is are you and the architect? Yeah, the architect is as well. Yeah. So to me, um, it depends on the project, it depends on the owner and the architect, but the most important person to me on any job, not knowing those details, is the landscape architect. 
Um, the owner's paying for it and they need to be happy. But ultimately, the owners come and go. Uh, and not a lot of business comes from owners that do more work. Uh, most of it comes from the relationship I have with a landscape architect or a general contractor. And uh, it's much more important for me when I'm put in the situation of choosing, and I often have to do this, who's right, the architect or the owner, and how to deal with this scenario, to uh, choose a landscape architect because it's going to be the same architect on the next job, and it's going to be a different owner down the road. Um, it's not to say you don't have to please them, but it, it's, it's a balance, I would say. And in collaboration, um, you've got to please everybody. So, um, you know, it's the, it's the customer's role to pay for the project. Ultimately, they need to be happy with the, the product. Uh, the landscape architect is, has the design vision, and it's important as a contractor to respect that role. I'll go on one job that won't have a landscape architect on it, and I am the designer. They're doing maybe a small renovation that's not an architect, and, and I'm doing design work. You have to remember when I move to the next job that does have an architect that that's not my role anymore, and that if a question comes up, I'm not solving that problem. I'm putting that back to the architect and respecting their role in the project. And as a contractor, I go back to my graphic originally of balancing cost or budget, uh, craftsmanship, and schedule on a project. And that's the role I take. So a few more minutes for questions. Any questions for Aaron? I could have talked longer. No. How long does the sheet multi typically take? Relative to what? Take to install, take to for this stuff below it to down. Oh, good question. So uh, the Drake's Landing project, what sold me on sheet mulching was the Drake's Landing project where we lay down cardboard, three inches of compost, and then we hydro seeded on top of that. And before we did that project, um, it was typical hard turf. You could touch it like this, and your hand might sink in an inch at the most just through the thatch layer of the turf. Six months after that, it was sheet mulch and the, the wildflowers were up and I went out there. And you were able to put your hand into the soil that deep just by pushing down through. So it, it obviously went right through the three inches of compost and whatever minimal batch that was developed from that planting and the cardboard. The cardboard was gone, you couldn't even find it. And what was amazing to me was the soil biology that totally changed by putting that organic compost on there, it affected all of that other soil, which allowed you to push your hand another three inches into the soil. And it, it started to naturally aerate that soil um, and bring the soil to life so that it uh, was healthier. And it was just amazing to me because a you know, traditional method would have been you have to rip eight inches deep to get the soil aerified, and this just did it naturally. So I don't know how long it takes, I know it takes less than six months. Yeah. So it's a great way to do it because the, the seeds stay on top. You're covering. Well, it depends on what you're planting. Right. Like your your wild thing. Mm -hmm. And then the root system goes. It just goes right through. Through the cardboard, and then it actually ends up composting. Yeah. It, it's it's a nice way. Yeah. And it helps with erosion too, doesn't it? Uh, I don't know about erosion itself. No, I wouldn't say it's an erosion control method because there's times where I've done this on hillsides and we actually have to okay. use jute netting or something right. method. Right, right. I meant flat. Yeah. You yeah. know, prevent runoff. Well, yeah, because you're you're grading in such a way that you prevent runoff anyway because right. you're adding so much material on top. Right. But, uh, do you only use this for turf, or could you use it for, say, a brown field that has uh, weeds and so on? You could use it on that. The whole idea is that you're, you know, through the lack of sunlight, uh, you're killing off the plant material. Somewhat lack of oxygen, but we're actually using cardboard that's corrugated, so it provides some oxygen. Mm -hmm. You can't have an oxygen-free, or I should say air, they're not living in oxygen, air-free environment, um, or you would kill the soil biology. But you don't have to worry about the seed bank, the existing seed bank that you're covering? It's actually better that way. If you don't mind the field in this no. if you if you go into a brown field and you till it, you're going to stir up all the seeds that are dormant underneath. If you sheet mulch it, they stay down there and they don't come up. It's too deep. Yeah, it's too deep and it, and they're just they're undisturbed. They need to be they need to have some light to germinate. So yeah. if they're down underneath, it's way better off sheet mulch. Yeah. 
Yeah. And all you need to do is like weed, weed wax down so you can like yeah. shake off. They, they often do it on top of blackberry. And you can do two or three layers of cardboard to kill blackberry. Yeah. yeah, it will actually kill blackberry by sheet mulching it. Yeah. Okay, we have to terminate your end here because there's another class coming in. Some of you, oh, first of all, let's thank uh, Aaron. <coughs> came in a little late. There's some handouts up here in the front. For all of you, uh, there's copies of Aaron's um, our presentation up here. Also, you, as you all know, the presentation will be put online. I'll put it, we have that up here. By, by it's, already, it's already on slide if you want to download it on slide. Um, there's only five copies of the presentation. So I don't there, but the other handouts are all the up here for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.